You just know a story is going to be good when a Supreme Court justice refuses to comment and instead races to get ahead of the story with their own def defense before the news breaks, before the public has even seen the allegations. That's definitely the case here, where Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito raced to publish this op-ed in the Wall Street Journal entitled, ProPublica Misleads Its Readers. The story that got Justice Alito playing defense is this one. It's an incredible piece of investigative journalism showing that Justice Alito was treated to a major taste of the sweet life by a conservative billionaire who later had business before the court at least 10 times. Justice Alito didn't recuse himself from any of those cases. Okay, see the guy in the red in the middle of the picture here holding the gigantic fish. That is Justice Samuel Alito. The guy on the right in green... That's the conservative billionaire Paul Singer. In 2008, Mr. Singer flew Justice Alito to Alaska on a private jet for a multi-day luxury fishing trip. Now, if Justice Alito had chartered the plane himself, the cost would have exceeded $100,000 one way. Alito never disclosed that flight, and he didn't recuse in the cases that Singer was involved in before the court. Justice Alito's defense, which again he published in the Wall Street Journal in an op-ed rather than simply replying to ProPublica's request for comment, his defense was twofold. Number one, he said that the seat he occupied on the private jet would have gone unoccupied if he didn't take it. Now, Alito's excuse here is hilarious for a lot of reasons. Number one, being that you could kind of use that excuse for anything, right? I mean, this luxury hotel room would have been vacant. I was just using a billionaire's extra apartment while it sat empty. The argument is weak tea. But I want to look at Justice Alito's second argument and billionaire Paul Singer's response, because the second defense sounds really reasonable at first blush. At second blush, if there's such a thing, it doesn't hold up to scrutiny. First, let's start with Singer's response. Singer says he didn't organize the trip and he didn't discuss it with his business. He didn't discuss his business interests while on the trip which is possible. But pivotally, Singer also argued that the time, at the time of the trip, neither Singer nor his companies had business before the court or could have anticipated that they would have business before the court in the future. ProPublica very clearly debunks that last bit. It turns out that the year before the fishing trip, in 2007, there was a very specific case in which one of Mr. Singer's companies had asked the Supreme Court to intervene. And after the trip, that company and the opposing party kept asking again and again. Okay, so now this gets us to Alito's second argument. When that case that I was just talking about eventually did make it to the Supreme Court in 2014, Alito claims he was, quote, not aware and had no good reason to be aware that Mr. Singer had an interest, end quote, in the case. Now, this one's a little hard to believe once you look at the case in question. Take a look at this. This is the Libertad. It is the prize ship of the Argentinian Navy. In 2012, it made international headlines because it was impounded, effectively held hostage by the government of Ghana on behalf of a hedge fund, Paul Singer's hedge fund. It was an international incident. At one point, guns were drawn. The whole thing had to be resolved by the UN's International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. And Paul Singer wasn't some anonymous figure in all of this. Well, that is the showdown between Paul Singer, the man who runs Elliott Associates, uh, and, uh, well, Argentina. Argentina described Paul Singer as a vulture capitalist. Argentina defaulted on its debt in 2001, and Singer's hedge fund reportedly bought up Argentinian bonds for pennies on the dollar, like a fire sale. In fact, Singer's fund purchased the majority of their Argentine bonds from June through November of 2008 for about 20 cents on the dollar, a year after the Supreme Court denied their first appeal request and while Singer was fishing with Alito. That trip was July 2008. Then they acted basically like a junk debt buyer would in a small claims court, but on an international scale, demanding full payment. And Singer was very public about this, pulling stunts like the one with the Navy ship and at one point even trying to seize the Argentine president's plane, like their version of Air Force One. That was the incredi incredibly public decade-long fight that brought Singer's hedge fund before the Supreme Court. The court ruled in Singer's favor seven to one with Alito in tow. 
And Singer's firm ended up walking away with a reported $2.4 billion, $2.4 billion, a return on what was reportedly a $117 million investment. Oh, we're not done, by the way. The month after the Supreme Court ruling, because of this hedge fund owned by the, the hedge fund owned debt situation, the entire country of Argentina defaulted on its debt a second time. And news outlets across the country framed the whole thing as Argentina versus Paul Singer. So sure, maybe it's possible that Justice Alito didn't know Paul Singer was involved, but Alito really must not have done his research. Ultimately, that case was not decided by Alito alone. The ruling, as I said, was seven to one. And it's impossible to know if anything Singer did or said swayed Alito at all. But between the $100,000 flight, the lack of disclosure, the lack of recusal, the lame excuses, and the attempt to smear ProPublica in the Wall Street Journal, something here stinks. And it ate the fish. Joining us now is the ProPublica reporter, Joshua Kaplan. He's part of the team that broke this illuminating story about Justice Alito last night. Josh, good to see you. Thank you for being with us. I just want to get down to the bottom of this because Alito is claiming he's got a very peripheral, tangential relationship with Singer. But there was stuff happening in 2006, uh, 2007 with Singer and the Argentinian government. And, and this, this, this uh, was still going on when this fishing trip went on. How did Alito get onto this fishing trip? Yes, it's a really interesting question because actually, well, one thing we learned is they hadn't met before, uh, this billionaire and Justice Alito. So Singer, the billionaire, was invited on this trip by Leonard Leo. He's the longtime leader of the Federalist Society who helped handpick Trump's uh, lists of Supreme Court nominees. And uh, Singer was a major donor to Leo. He invited him on this trip. And then he asked if uh, Leo and Alito could fly on his private jet. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot we still don't know about the genesis of this trip, but all roads so far point to Leo. I mean, he's the only connection between these various prominent guests on the trip. It was a trip with uh, the justice that Leo had just played a key role in confirming to the Supreme Court, uh, a judge that Leo had clerked for, and then two major donors to Leo's network of political groups. So Leo has responded to your article, Leonard yes. Leo. He had said, quote, I would never presume to tell the justices what to do, and no objective and well-informed observer of the judiciary honestly could believe that they decide cases in order to cull favor with friends or in return for a free plane seat or a fishing trip. Leonard Leo's incredulous that someone might take something in response for something else. Now, you work for an organization and I work for an organization that has rules about what you can take for people, from people, right? The rule doesn't say I can't take a gift because I might fall under their influence. The rule says you can't take the gift so that the public can understand that I don't take gifts from people and it's, you don't take gifts from people. It's not a whether or not you did something. It's a these guys just don't seem to understand rules. Yeah, I mean, exactly. There's, uh, there's no evidence that this was a quid pro quo, uh, that there was a specific ruling in exchange for a specific gift. But I think what this underscores here is that, you know, the rules you're talking about that you and I have as journalists are also rules that are very strictly in place in just about every other part of the federal government. Correct. In terms of uh, what gifts you can take from outside parties, uh, what you have to disclose, and all manner of other things. I mean, these are the trips that we're talking about here would be unheard of for virtually ever every other employee of the federal government. So interesting way this happened. You guys write this article. Mm -hmm. You ask for response from Alito. He then publishes an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, which is odd. Um, but then this evening, the Wall Street Journal published an editorial as well, in which it says ProPublica's focus on recusal is the latest angle in the progressive campaign to cripple the court's new majority. By imposing even tenuous associations as grounds for recusal, litigants can exclude certain justices from hearing a case. With a court of only nine justices, this could determine the outcome. Call it court thinning rather than court packing, but the effect would be similar. So they are ascribing... Uh, motive to the fact that you wrote this article. That's something that suggests that you're trying to somehow hobble the Supreme Court. You're writing an article, which is what you at ProPublica do. You research things, you uncover things, you report things, and you write the article. Uh, yes. Um, so 
I mean, to be clear, we are covering the Supreme Court because uh, last year, my, my colleague Justin and I uh, were thinking about how it seems like the judiciary just doesn't get covered like other branches of government. There is vigorous coverage of Congress people of both parties, of presidents, of cabinet officials, and there's relative, like, there's not a history of investigative coverage of the Supreme Court or the lower courts for that matter. And, uh, you know, turns out uh, as we started digging that there's a lot to find there, I think because uh, the rules that exist in these other branches just aren't in place uh, right. when it comes to the Supreme Which, Court. Which, by the way, most of us didn't know and we have now learned. Right. But you are bearing witness and you're trying to hold to account, but the Wall Street Journal tonight says that you've got some effort to undermine the court. Yeah. Would I, would it, is it be fair to say, I'm going to ask you that, do you have some effort to undermine there's the Supreme Court? There's absolutely no effort to undermine the court. And I feel like there's a, there's a valence in the editorial, of course, that this is a partisan motivation as well, uh, which I can say that we are actively reporting on all the justices and we are you know, eager to learn as much as we can about um, ethics on the Supreme Court with you know, no regards to partisanship. Thanks for your reporting. Thank you. Josh Kaplan, thanks for making the time tonight. All right.